We all live in a digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. Hi everyone and welcome to this BPF Gender and Access Open Interactive Roundtable, uh, which would be discussing and exploring gender disinformation. My name is Amrita Chaudhary and I'm a MAG member who was facilitating, one of the facilitators for this group. Um, so we would want this discussion to be absolutely interactive um, and you can always raise your hand or post your question query on the chat and we will try to take it. Uh, but before we start, I would pass it over to Wim, who would be explaining more about uh, the BPF gender and access, what we do for those who do not know about it in brief. Wim, over to you. Uh, thank you. I don't know if it's possible to let me share my slides. If I, I guess if you're logged in, you should be uh, able to, yeah. would the, uh, you know, uh, the support team provide Wim with access to share his presentation? And in the meantime, the work uh, which we have Wim. done. W-I-M. Yeah. And in the meantime, if you want, I will just put it into the chat, the document we would be referring to. Just give me a moment. Okay, this looks uh, wonderful. Okay, good morning and welcome all people online. Uh, welcome from uh, Poland, Katowice. Uh, it's great to be here and I would say it's great to see people online. It's a pity for those, uh, I say, that are not able to make it here because I've found it a real surprise how the local host has been able with additional screens on the wall and, and a great, great video and, and transcript uh, to make uh, this type of session uh, different than what you're used to. You used to go to a session where there is remote participation, but I must say I am surprised how with, with some well thought uh, adaptions and, and arrangements in the room, they were able to, uh, to give this a completely other uh, sense of the meeting so that uh, we're way more involved with people that are, uh, are online. Uh, so let me briefly explain two things before we start dive into the discussion. First of all, my role and second, the role of the best practice forum. So I'm uh, Wim de Huzel. I'm a consultant part uh, working with the IGF Secretariat to support intersessional work and in specific my role to support best practice forums. Uh, best practice forums are an intersessional activity of, uh, of the IGF. Intersessional activities means uh, it is work that is being done, discussions that are ongoing in between two IGF meetings. And for that, they get support also from the, uh, from the security itself. The idea between best practice forums is uh, not to have policy discussions in the terms of developing uh, new uh, new recommendations are, are really focused on uh, coming up with um, with new policy. No, it is specific. A specific focus is on uh, looking into a uh, into an issue, into a problem, trying to um, understand uh, understand that issue and how it is addressed and and how it is addressed in different parts of the world to be able to uh, learn. Uh, from each other to be able to share experiences. Uh, so I think it's very important to understand it's a, com it's a different context uh, than, for example, another um, stream within the IGF intersessional work, which, uh, which are the policy networks that are way more focused on, uh, on exact policy, best practice forms, or uh, more focused on looking at a specific topic at an issue uh, see how that issue is understood in uh, different uh, parts of the world and also what the answers are um, 
that people from different stakeholders, different communities uh, come up with uh, to address the issue. Uh, practically, uh, best practice forums start, start to work um, in spring, in the spring of the year, after the MAG agreed on what topics they should uh, focus on. Uh, so then start the series of online discussions, which I think this um, best practice forum really had an, an, a series also of learning discussions with, uh, with different specialists uh, between uh, May, April, June, August, which were very interesting. They are partly reflected in the report, but also in a separate, uh, summarized in a separate section uh, or in a separate document online on the, um, uh, that is on the uh, BPF website. Um, that's important because this is only this session is only a limited part of the work of the uh, of the best practice forum. Most of the interesting thing is happening in the period before, uh, where different stakeholders, different people are coming together to look at a specific issue uh, from different sides. Like I said, this BPF has been working in a number. Uh, I lost track, probably eight, nine, ten. Um, online conversations and the report is uh, just like reflect trying to reflect what was discussed uh, as part of the work also this session uh, is intended to uh, to continue the discussion this is not um, the, the BPF has been working on a draft report but this session is nothing like uh, or is not intended like we come to present our results no, uh, this session for best practice forum is uh, really crucial because it's uh, giving like the intermediate update in the draft report. And look, this is where we stand with our uh, our discussion with the input we had, and then um, checking with the people here at IGF uh, and invite additional input. So part of the um, discussion today um, will be will be reflected again in the final BPF report that will be published shortly after uh, the IGF meeting. I think that's enough as an introduction because I can uh, talk longer for, for best practice forums. Maybe one thing, uh, this is not the first time there is a best practice forum on, gen on gender related issues. Uh, it's the first time that the title is gender and digital rights, but there has been a number of uh, best practice forums on gender and access. I would uh, suggest to uh, check the IGF website because each of them has uh, produced very useful output reports. Uh, if you're interested in the topic, it's a really interesting re resource. They're also summarized in the annex of the um, uh, sorry in the annex of the draft report. Um, so. Before uh, handing over to Bruna, maybe I can just introduce the, the topic. Uh, this year, the MAC, uh, the advisor, MAC advisory group uh, selected two topics for best practice forum. One is on cybersecurity and uh, focused on cybersecurity norms that BPF has a session tomorrow morning, uh, local time here. The second is the BPF uh, gender and digital rights. And the uh, proposal that was uh, put in or the uh, was agreed by the MAC was to have to have it focused on uh, the concept of gender on of gender disinformation, a relatively new concept. Uh, so we will discuss later on um, with you uh, a relatively new concept. What means uh, there's still I, I had the feeling with working with uh, the people involved in the BPF that there is still room to discuss the exact uh, definition. Uh, there's still a very big need to exchange experiences with gender disinformation from people around the world. Uh, and as a um, last thing that the question, and we will come back to that, uh, that it might be too early to already talk uh, of uh, about best practices uh, because we still, or people around, different communities are still trying to uh, to answer or, or give the first reaction to the phenomenon or, or so there is no yet uh, a clear list of tested and uh, used best practices. Uh, but then I would like to uh, hand over to 
one of the co-coordinators um, of the best practice forum, Ms. Bruna, to <coughs> sorry, take us see it's time for me to stop uh, to take us through the uh, rest of the session. Okay. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you all for joining the session. We have just about um, almost thirty people on thirty people online and two more people on the presidential like uh, meeting. And um, as we were saying, like this is a BPF that has been going on since 2015. And we have tried to address like the most different um, aspects of the, 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 our lives, like female and, and women in um, some part of, of these groups lives online. So some of the things we have discussed before was gender-based violence and, and other things related to that, access as well. And we felt at that, um, in 2021, moving on to the whole discussion around digital rights and disinformation as part of a hate campaign or as part of campaigns who are directed towards women online. So it was, was kind of the next movement for us. But as we were saying, um, we fully understand that this is not um, by any means a final world word on this, on this topic, not at all. We understand gender disinformation as a rather new um, kind of movement or phenomena. And then um, our idea here is just to get this conversation started and based on the things we looked at um, in this past um, year. And just looking at the term and the working definition that this BPF has used um, was um, information activities like creating, sharing, or disseminating content that can result in an attack or undermining people on the basis of their gender, or, or they um, sometimes weaponize um, gender narratives to prom promote a political and social or economical objectives. So that is one of the definitions we have addressed. And um, throughout our work, like we, we just try to really speak with um, some specialists, some part of the IGF community um, and many other groups who would be interested in that. Um, we do understand that might be, or that might feel that we are kind of addressing something very similar to gender-based violence online, but we did want, wanted to go a little further on disinformation campaign, campaigns and how they would affect um, female and women's lives online. So. Um, that is one thing. I think we can go to the next slide. I was just typing in the, the chat, uh, but I can as well say it. I, I would say people that are listening online or also the people in the room, as this is intended to be an interactive session, yes. do not hesitate to at any moment uh, raise your hand, ask questions, and we will fit them in. Um, thank you. Yes, um, yes, definitely. So please join, please raise your hands and, and or just like take the floor um, because we really want to set a, an open conversation. And um, moving on to, to telling you guys how we try to discuss the gender disinformation phenomenon, like we try to divide um, this, this situation into um, six, five categories groups. So we looked into everyday gender misinformation, disinformation, youth experiences as well, because in one of our meetings, it was also pointed out to us that some disinformation campaigns directed at female, young female, might also be a barrier to their existence or like to, to their presence in a lot of the political discussions online. Um, journalists as well, because it, it's known for pretty much everyone or everyone that um, Journalists have been also victims of pretty serious campaign coming from all over the world. And I'm speaking as a president, I guess, um, Bolsonaro has been a, one of the main presidents who, who has been trying to do so, some of those things. Also politicians, because um, in the past years, there is also has been an ongoing use of hate speech as a silencing, as a silencing to, to more diverse um, candidacies and to more, more diverse um, politicians and um, last but not least, hum, women human rights defenders. So these were the five groups we tried to address in our draft report. And um, while we were trying to understand and comprehend how gender disinformation worked towards these groups, we also tried to check um, whether or not it was okay or nice for us to highlight some of the best practices 
um, and also to see whether or not like platforms or even um, some groups, civil society and academia, they had um, existing or exciting answers to, to the to the issue we have highlighted, or even if there were like any emerging best practices on that. So that is part of our report as well. Um, I think we can go to the next slide. You wanna add something, Wayne? Uh, no, but there was one question or comment in the chat. I don't know if... So Wim, he was having a problem in speaking. Um, it was Jamie, uh, perhaps he can raise his hand and try because he had a comment. Uh, um yes it, it, it's a she it's jamie um yeah if you can raise your hand um perhaps um the tag team can also allow you to speak jamie um so there is no hand option <laughs> okay yeah if you want to maybe type um your question we can just okay, um, well, read them outline. yeah the question was um actually to reflect on why is it uh, difficult to go to, uh, the full extent of uh, the issue of uh, gender disinformation is that something you want to yes on now yeah. or i mean we can just and later yeah we can do it later yeah for, okay. sure, for sure so um yeah then we can go to the next slide yeah so um and in addressing this um, definition and, and situation, we also had some guiding questions as well. So we wanted to check in and take a look on how the, the, the situation of gender disinformation could be defined or understood by different groups, um, whether people had different experiences um, around them. Um, also, how far has the world come to the platformization of this information in the context of COVID-19, because um, it has also come like across many of the meetings, many, many of our meetings with the specialists that um, this was also something pertaining to um, stronger and maybe more present content moderation strategies. So that was also something that came up to us. Um, the third question we had was um, about who are the actual like missing voices in the fight against misinformation at the national, regional, and global level? And um, last but not least, how is trust building manifesting in this multi-stakeholder process? Um, and, and just to speak about trust building, I think like one of the main goals of this IGF in the past year was to have like a frank and open and, and trustful conversation with our members in the IGF community around gender, because we also sometimes acknowledge that this is not a subject that's truly present in the agenda. So we also wanted to use this as a safe space to have a conversation around um, gender misinformation. So that's that. We can go to the next slide. I don't know if anyone has any comments on the chat or um, if um, Rita or any of our co-coordinators of the BPF wanted to come in on that note. No, I think we're good, Bruna. Perhaps we can go back to the previous slide where we had yes. the questions. And perhaps we could also ask the audience here if uh, if you can have the questions within the last slide. Yeah, as in, um, you know, how do you define or understand gender di disinformation, um, you know, what are the experiences? As in we did, uh, Bruna did mention there are different specific categories we looked at. Um, and Jimmy, as you uh, asked, is it difficult to gauge the full extent of the issue? Yes, because the manifestations are different. The apparent, um, you know, you may apparently think that this is, uh, this is only the issue, but the repercussions may be far reaching too. So uh, that is why it's very tricky. Um, disinformation definitely is being looked at by, um, everyone, uh, but when it comes to gender-based disinformation, which we all know is occurring, um, it's, it's still not uh, being gauged to that extent. Uh, so would anyone want to speak on any of these points? Um, you know, you have been looking at various reports, et cetera, as in who are the missing links, who should be there? Um, you know, how can trust be built? Anyone? Yeah. I think also I wanted to come back also on uh, Jamie's question. Um, the fact that um, 
the first question we we asked, and one of the first things the BPF started with was looking into the definition and asking how do you understand gender disinformation is probably already a part of the on answer, uh, because if you still uh, have to to come up with a, with a clear definition or understand how people uh, see the phenomenon or even raise awareness about the phenomenon of gender disinformation. Uh, that's partially already the first, or, or that's the first part of the answer. Why is it difficult to, to really go to measure and, and, and see the full extent of the, of the problem, uh, of the issue? And, uh, and also then later on makes it difficult uh, to already come up with, uh, with best practices and measures to, to deal with it. Yeah, and just, just to build up on that, like some of the two main premises like we had um, when addressing this discussion was that um, gender-based disinformation was being deployed as a strategy against women and gender diverse groups. So that was one thing. And, and parting from that, like we wanted to understand like which were the negative effects and how was there like some level of a spillover over a set of rights such as political participation um, and what and to what extent um, this spillover our rights, our digital rights, um, could allow um, gender disinformation to be used as part of those political projects of moral policy, censorship, hierarchization of citizenship and rights as well, because we know this, this is something that's going on. But I, I see somebody has um, the mic and the hand up, so please go ahead and introduce yourself, please. Um, thank you very much. My name is Nema Lugangira. I'm a member of parliament from Tanzania. And first of all, I'm very fortunate that I got to attend, I think, one or two of the online sessions. And I'm particularly pleased that you've also put politicians there um, because I think one of the groups that is also highly impacted by this issue is women politicians, particularly in developing countries where you know, our regulations and definitions are not so much clearer, perhaps like in the developed countries. Um, what I can say, you asked about the impact and I can speak from experience that when a female parliamentarian perhaps shares online, um, maybe a contribution they made in parliament or a meeting or, or whatever, or I could even post that I'm here um, in, in Poland attending this meeting the reaction of majority of people will not be based on the content of what I shared, but then it ends up being sexualized. Um, I can give an example. Let's say I take a picture with any of the gentlemen here and post that here uh, we are in the IGF. Immediately it will be seen, yeah, you women parliamentarians, we know what you do when you go abroad, busy sleeping around. You know, that kind of, it gets twisted from the actual to being sexualized. And unfortunately, you, you don't get the opportunity. And, and in any case, you're not even able to go everywhere and defend yourself and say, oh no, this is not true because it's, it's spread. And by the time you go to the community that you're leading, even though you're speaking, but they're busy saying, yeah, but this is what she does. Even online, they said it. So how to prove that what was said online is not true becomes difficult. But now when you look at the impact of it, I can just give an example. In Tanzania, we have about 146, 143, 146 female parliamentarians. But those who are online actively, we're not even 13. And even for us, it's not easy. It's a horrific experience, but we just have to try to bear it. Bear it. But the rest, they just don't want to be online because it's not safe. Someone is like, I don't want to put myself through that. And I have an experience of being online prior to being a member of parliament and post being a member of parliament. The two are incredibly different. And it's good that you've highlighted the different groups because the impact for a female politician is... Uh, I can perhaps say maybe far worse because it goes to affect the kids. I remember there's a time my kids were teenagers, they were getting, you know, the posts that people are saying about me and they're like, mom, just get offline. So it affects them. But the biggest impact is, is that um, most countries, especially in developing countries, we want to reach 50-50.
in, in women in politics, in leadership, right? So there's a lot of efforts towards trying to get political aspirants to come forward, young girls coming up, the youth, women. But most of them, one of the first things that makes them feel they don't wanna get into politics is the fact that once you're a politician, you get subjected to all of this. So I guess this, this is a very important um, discussion, but perhaps we need, when we're talking about um, the trust building manifesting in multi-stakeholder processes, we can also try and include political parties um, because political parties have their own constitutions and perhaps because uh, it's been proven that oftentimes um, the people attacking are affiliated to one party or the other. So maybe also political parties have a role and responsibility in curbing this online abuse on, on women parliamentarians. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nima. And um, there, there just has been a comment on, ch on the chat as well on how you were a compelling speaker. And we just wanted to thank you also for all your help with the report and everything else. But um, but yeah, we, I, I, we kind of agree with um, what you just pointed out. And, and like when we went through a lot of the meetings with specialists and everything else, we also knew that this was something that was way more common that we understood. Like um, there are some researchers from Brazil um, from a think tank called Internet Lab that while addressing the, the regional elections last year, they did, um, they did find out that um, women were way more um, subjected to racist, misogynistic kind of political speech online. And, and that the, the whole like experience or, or the whole like usage of um, a little more complicated language were, was, was still there, was still very much there. And against those, those more diverse um, candidates, as, as I was saying. And also um, when, when we had a chat in one of our calls as well with Courtney Reg, which is, which, it, which is also one of the MAG members, she did again point out that um, this was not just going on with politicians as well, and, but also with journalists and the rising attack that like normally governments, they direct towards like free and open media and whoever is willing to have more access to information. So we do understand that this is being used um, as a strategy and, and this is why we try to highlight some of those groups. We fully understand that they're not like all the groups who are subject to um, gender disinformation, but as we start, as we were starting to set this conversation on this topic, these were the ones we felt like were worth um, highlighting or or giving a shout out something like that. Yeah, there's also a comment sorry in the in the chat from uh, Marcel. I don't know from uh, where say that actually confirming what you said. What even if you're as a as a woman online, you're already exposed very easily to this kind of disinformation going on. Uh, but when uh, you get uh, a public uh, or take a public role, it just gets worse. So. So Wim, we have a hand up from Shilonga. Oh. So let's go to Wim like to speak. Yeah, maybe first the online yes. and then we... Yes. We're going to go with the online uh, participant. And then, and Somebody then from uh, Cameroon. Uh, sorry, Marcel was from uh, Cameroon. Yes, Marcel was from Cameroon. Shilonga, you would have to unmute yourself. Can you speak up now? Hi, good afternoon. Good morning. Um, sorry, I'm not going to apologize. I'm not going to switch on my video because then I'll lose you. Um, and I missed a little bit of the presentation at the beginning. However, um, my name is Christofina Shilongo. I work for Research ICT Africa, and I just wanted to pitch in on um, the third question on who are the missing voices in the fight against disinformation at various levels. Um, so I just, we recently completed a, a study with uh, the University of Cape Town on misinformation and um, the actors who are fighting against disinformation on the continent. We covered the sub-Saharan Africa uh, region, and one of the things that came to um, that you know the actors pointed out was that um, you know there are I don't I don't want to say missing. It's just people who whose voices are not heard. So we spoke to organizations, for instance, in Ghana, the Association for People Living with Albinism and um, various organizations in Ghana who are fighting, you know, the witches um, in the women witches 
um, in, in, in Ghana. And they, you know, for years, they've been fighting against, you know, myths. They've been termed as myths. But in present day times, you can call them disinformation because it's, it's really like information against them and it's a violation of their human rights. And so um, speaking to the missing voices, it's really if we recognize misinformation uh, pertaining to vulnerable groups like women or people living with albinism, LGBTQ groups, for instance, um, in Uganda, we spoke to um, um, sexual minority groups. And they have been fighting misinformation. It's and and I think to recognize those missing voices, we need to also see how this um, this information is linked to a violation of human rights and also um, exclusion, the social exclusion of certain groups. So whether it's women, whether it's people living with albinism, whether it's people living with uh, or people who are part of the LGBTQ um, community, and. Um, so when we looked at the kind of responses that they ha have, or that you know the way that they are countering and protecting their communities against um, um, the harms caused by disinformation or myths, as you, you know they call them, is that they look at different approaches. So um, on a national level, for instance, in Uganda, this um, yeah in in Ghana, the uh, Association for Albinism. Um, you know, they, they do community outreach, they do, um, they advocate policy advocacy. So they've included a clause in the Communications Act to protect vulnerable groups like the, like people like themselves. Um, they are looking at, you know, um, they've also, you know, ventured into social media using radio. I know there's a lot of, I think there's a, a disconnect with the global North, for instance. Um, prioritizing platforms, digital platforms, but radio is widely used in many countries um, in sub-Saharan Africa. And so they have, you know, extended into radio. They're talking to community leaders, church leaders, any kinds of, um, all sorts of leaders within um, the region. And they've also like collaborated with various other um, partner associations, for instance, in, in Ghana, the Association for uh, Albinism is, you know, working with the association in, in Malawi and they are working with um, partner organizations in the UK. So it's really like, you know, they've have coordinated this like very multi um, uh, multi stakeholder approach and it's very coordinated. And I think if we kind of um, maybe include mis um, these various definitions of misinformation to include myths and cultural st stereotypes. I mean, they have been named a cultural st uh, stereotypes by, you know, before the fake news era. I think we can include those missing voices. Thank you so much. Um, we also have another comment in the room, so please go ahead. Uh, well, uh, good morning. I'm a member of the parliament from Pakistan. And uh, being a woman, I've uh, faced a lot of challenges, I must say. And when specifically it comes to uh, social media code of conduct, I've always tried to raise my voice for this particular subject. Uh, I'm also the member of the Standing Committee for uh, Information Technology. And I feel that it is a need of the time that we need to work specifically on some ethical grounds so that other people are not facing the same kind of situations that I'm facing. Um, well, uh, the main issue that we faced in Pakistan is fake Twitter accounts and fake Facebook accounts. People get easily create fake accounts and then they can abuse anybody. They can disinform and uh, they get away with it because there's there, there wasn't a particular mechanism to get hold of them. And uh, above all, we also did not have a smooth uh, or a swift kind of a coordination with the social media service providers. But now with a lot of efforts that we've been making in this particular issue, uh, we've uh, seen that uh, after creating um, a cyber crime cell or a cyber crime wing that exists now in Pakistan, it's uh, turned much easier for us to reach those people who misuse this particular social media tool to abuse, to create fake news or disinform. Uh, hence, I think that uh, definitely as a woman, I've always felt that the challenges are double, the double standards are double, and uh, uh, women have to 
pay extra effort in every walk of life and specifically when it comes to so, uh, social media and especially when it comes to political arena uh, so i think uh, we all all the women around the globe because the it's a digital world it's just not a matter of pakistan or any particular part of the world it's a digital world we all need to work out on this to stop these uh, fake accounts to stop people spreading fake news but for that we need immense support of the social media service providers thank you thank you so much and just one short comment on around that like in one of our meetings um the bpf meetings with specialists because we did run some meetings with a lot of specialists um on this field that we're like trying to address the same situation, like one of them has pointed out to us that this rhetoric around fake news has been like increasingly translated into legislation and regulation to um, try or at least attempt to reduce misinformation. But sometimes um, legislators did not fully grasp um, the amount or the size of the issue and did not really come up yet with the strategies on how to address this specific problem of gender the misinformation because that that was some of our diagnosis as well like we still needed to develop like some common sense around what is a possible and common strategy for the issue of gender disinformation and that that's also in our report um some of the things we did um we did think through like looking forward was that um, there was still a lot to be done at the political campaigning level in order to suppress attacks towards candidates um, who are responsible for exer exer exacerbating gendered stereotypes or fostering like inequality and oppression, but also um, introducing some level of gender sensitive standards for political campaigning and politicians and parties as well, because um, this is also something that does not necessarily need to be addressed once you guys are at the parliament, but also needs to be something that's on the very making of the political campaigns and the electoral processes as well, just so you're way less under those types of attacks than um, you are on your everyday work. And um, last but not least, um, we also know that um, gender disinformation um, directed towards politician can often come disguised or perceived as a kind of a legitimate or um, political critique. But we do know that in the end, it's something that um, portrays you as women who are sometimes assigned to higher public offices and everything else as unfit, undeserving, incompetent, and a lot of those things. And, and we do know that all of those questions that society has about us they are all translated into those kind of campaigns. So that was also something that's present in our report and we were very much concerned with. So it's it's very nice to be hearing the things from you too and to, to, having, to have this conversation. I don't know if anyone um, in the chat has any more questions or um, I see Jamie also posted um, a link to an article about um, toxic culture in, in parliament houses as well. Um, and in a documentary too, um, and um, and yeah, yeah. She she's also asking for um, the person who just spoke to talk about again, if possible, about the cybercrime cell slash wing worked, um, and how was it funded, um, and, and and whether or not was there a decision by the government to support that. Because I wanted to come back on that too, because I found that very interesting. It's the first time also in all our discussions that I heard somebody making the explicit link between all the work that's going on on cybersecurity and cyber work and saying, well, maybe there needs to be a link and a direct channel that uh, the that we have access to the people that work on cybercrime and it is recognized as a real problem. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, this is a uh, very interesting. We've had it had this uh, cyber crime wing, uh, which we call the cyber crime cell as well, and it's linked with the Information Technology Committee. Also, it comes under the Federal Investigation Agency in Pakistan, that is the FIA. Uh, so we have specifically uh, staff and a uh, number of uh, hundreds of uh, trained people to uh, combat this issue. And uh, we have online uh, numbers 
if anybody feels any kind of harassment or any kind of social media related issues, they can simply call on the online number, free number. They can register their issue and they'll get a follow up. The, um, we've, we've apprehended a lot of people and even uh, we have legislation done in, for this particular uh, subject. So it's all legalized. It's through the Parliament of Pakistan. We've uh, managed to make a create a, a, a bring up laws to curb this issue in a better legal manner. So it's it's uh, actually it's a federal subject. And every province is connected to this particular agency. So anybody, anywhere in any province of Pakistan, if anybody is a victim, can directly. It's very simple. They can just call on that particular number, and they'll uh, be, uh, you know, taken care of. Uh, but but provided the social media service providers actually they take a longer period of time if anybody is facing any kind of issue related to facebook it will take much more time uh, but it's going to be much faster if it is concerned with the twitter twitter accounts can easily be reported and blocked and the ip addresses can be traced out with the help of the social media service providers and then uh, further action is taken Thank you. Thank you so much. Luna, we have uh, Cheryl's hand up. Yes, please go ahead. Um, and I see Cheryl, and I don't know if um, Shilongo has an, an old hand as well, but go ahead, Sharon. And hello. Uh, hello, and thank you very much. Uh, this is an extremely important conversation. I'm delighted to be listening into it. And I couldn't help but just make a little commentary. Um, I'm from Australia, and I'm from a particular vintage. Um, ancient, I think, is the classification I go by these days. Um, with uh, the questions in front of us at the moment, um, gender disinformation and experiences, this is a, this is a, a generation by generation um, issue. At the moment, our generations, almost three generations in fact, are very much involved with almost the same stuff happening, but with the power of very instantaneous communications uh, and the, all the things that we understand uh, online worlds and platforms bring forward. So there's a, a certain concentration. It's not new, it's what humans have been doing to each other in a power play. Uh, no, I'm not using male and female here, I'm just speaking to gendered here, because uh, it goes both ways. Um, you know, since we were you know, hanging off the trees and, and working out whether our tails would shorten. So whilst these things are not new, um, the tools that are being exploited are far more effective. And I think we need to recognise that. And I believe many of the speakers today have done exactly that. But that's where I think a particular point of the work on what my very biased view is, and that is the, the development of tools or capabilities of resilience. Because it's the resilience. This stuff is going to happen, ladies and gentlemen. But how resilient we are, be our politicians or our journalists or our youth or our, our, our bullied transgender and emerging, uh, finding ourselves, you know, youngsters. Whatever it is, if there is a disinformation and a tailored attacking on them, it, they're going to literally live and die in some cases by their resilience. And I think. It's those resilient skills that we need to look at. Now, that can, in my view, go hand and glove with learning to establish what is trusted and untrusted or validated and unvalidated information. We all know that disinformation can spread like wildfire if it's associated with a good orator, you know, someone who, who speaks well, presents convincingly, people who may not wish to look into the background where they say, oh, yes, well, of course, that must be the truth. And so if we can upskill people to be more discerning on what they accept as truth or not and help that resilience package, I think we can at least get these current generations um, through this bout of what is basically power play that is gendered. The multi-stakeholder process, and you can see I've gone through all four questions now. The multi-stakeholder process, however, where we have an opportunity to work with each other and learn about each other across norms and platforms and usual places and spaces that we work and play, 
is something rare, something new, and something vital to explore in the solution. So I'm not all doom and gloom and just get there. Um, I have been in a boardroom many, 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 many eons ago when I was the sole woman in that board and had a chairman, you know, slam his hands down on the table and ask, was I capable of eating my own young? Yeah, so this is, this is the sort of insult um, that unless we can find ways of empowering our politicians and our journalists and our youth and our, our gender, regardless of our choices of gender and how we identify, um, we need to help that not be the huge and deliberately intended insult and be something that can be used to display one's own resilience and build one's own power, at least in that dynamic. Anyway, I digress, um, but I just wanted to share some of those observations with you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cheryl. And, um, and we agree with you. Like one of the parts that we highlight in our report also is that maybe the place in which um, gender misinformation meets the IGF or, or the internet governance community is when we definitely need a proper multi-stakeholder approach to addressing this challenge, to, to ensure that we are working and moving towards a balance of rights, in particular disinformation and freedom of expression, as well as making sure every single stakeholder is also part of this conversation, not just platforms, not just civil society and not just the victims. So um, yeah, we, we are very much on the same page. Um, and Emma? So Marcel has a comment, I don't know whether wants to speak uh, or question, it says how do we shift from voted laws to their applications on the field? As we see also, it is difficult to ask um, for big tech for removing of wrong information circulating for an African citizen. I think, Bruna, it also brings us to the question of uh, content, um, you know, moderation by platforms, uh, the tra transparency or lack of transparency uh, they adopt in this entire, uh, you know, exercise. Um, I guess that's also a question, right, before us. Yes, yes. Um, and, and, and no, and then. Quick comment on on Marx. I think what um, also Cheryl said and, and and Bruna said that maybe there is also the importance of having that multi-stakeholder, the different people on the table. Because if you manage to have the the platforms on the table, the politicians on the table, and uh, and on other organizations, uh, then maybe you don't need yet that voted law. Uh, if you have those people recognizing the issue and and come up with clear ways uh, that they say if if you point out a problem to us we can see how to address it it can be an easier way to already start working while the discussion on legislation and how we have to deal with this um, from from a more uh, yeah legal or, or structural perspective um, that might be very easy well easy it's never an easy solution but a quicker solution to have the parties already around the table recognizing the issue and look for i would say those shortcuts to uh, take immediate uh, action absolutely Wim. i agree that you know the different stakeholders need to be there because it affects different stakeholders in different ways for example at times there is a concern when nation states actually make a rule for content moderation or removing even fake uh, accounts, uh, which is prevalent everywhere, um, there is a concern that many times it is used for political means too. So the balancing part is something where you need the multi-stakeholder people, um, you know, the, the stakeholders there to actually showcase that, look, it, this particular legislation may affect in this way or may not be effective for which it has been created. Bruna, I guess there's Nima who has her hand yes, up. So we, yeah. Please go ahead. Um, thank you. I think what I, I wanted to add on my colleague from Pakistan, um, even in Tanzania, we have a cyber, um, cyber crimes unit and we have a cyber law. But one of the biggest challenges, I don't know how it is in other countries, but at least I know in most African countries, is first to recognize online gender-based violence as one of the gender-based violences. Because oftentimes when we're talking about G GBV, the focus is on the physical ones, which is easier to prove. 
but when you're talking about online gender-based violence, you can't really, sometimes you cannot prove it. And even when you're talking about um, emotional, the, the amount of emotional distress it brings on you, the, the way it affects your mental state, you're not able to prove it. So perhaps maybe something that the best practice forum on gender and digital rights can do to come up with like a best practice guiding principle on what, when we're talking about um, gender and digital rights, what is the ideal picture? And then every country can, you know, use that as a base and then obviously customizes according to the local context of, of the respective country. Um, then the second part is with online, exactly like what my colleague said, most people use fake accounts. So then even if you have, you know, a very good regulation in place, but how do you prove it? How do you know the person that's attacking me is, Br is Bruno? How do you find Bruno when this person is uh, unknown? But is, isn't there a way that these social media platforms can actually know who the person is? You know, that is something that comes to the, you know, the, the, the social responsibility of the different social media platforms. You know, the shortcut that you were just talking about. I'm sure if they can figure out most of these things, can they not know that this is Nema? Even though I'm under a fake account, I'm sure there's a way that they can prove that. So perhaps maybe they have um, some kind of responsibility in towards making um, online spaces safer for all groups. But then there's the other issue of capacity building. Uh, many of us are online, but we're not capacitated on even how to protect ourselves online. Uh, I think very recently about maybe a month ago is when I got to realize that actually you can report at someone's tweet and ask for the person to be blocked. But I've been online for so long. Uh, so there's the issue of people knowing how to self protect themselves online. Um, and then the last thing that I wanted to say is the differences between abuse from one country to another, you know, like Twitter, et cetera, they have their guidelines and they have certain words that they've put in the al algorithm as um, that, that, you know, press the red flag, but maybe a word in the US, uh, maybe a word in Tanzania seems abusive, but in the US it's not. I'll, I'll just give one very, very um, small example. I think last week I posted something on Twitter and someone said, uh, wewe takataka. Takataka means rubbish, right? Now, from a European perspective, you know, someone calling, ah, you're just rubbish, it's not a big deal because of the interpretation. But for someone in Tanzania calling takataka, that's like, that's, that's, that's abusive. So how do you then get Twitter or Instagram or whoever to understand yeah. the difference. Europe, it's okay, but for us, it's not okay. So I think there's those things that, um, talking about the best practice, we can come up with the best practice of what's the ideal world, and then we can work, work, work on it from there. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. And just, just to come in on the, the legislation, legislation point, um, it, I don't know if anyone um, knows about that, but Brazil has been trying to um, set up its own um, legislation for disinformation in the past year. And whenever we start to discuss like how to address this topic in general, and it's not at all like directed towards um, gender disinformation, but the issue that we ha we're having right now is that it's very complicated and hard to um stop like legislators normally for going towards freedom of speech for going towards users rights and everything else and it needs to be a balanced um discussion as you were saying like because everyone knows that for many years um social media platforms have been aware of this kind of language online they have been done sometimes very little about that and i think situations such as the the facebook papers that just came out um also um, highlight how little they they have done and, and how some countries tend to be more important than others and, and how problematic is this general like inertia that social media companies, they tend 
um, to 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 like to be in um, with regards to countries like I don't know Brazil, India, or any other country that's not at that very high level um, list of interest for those companies and and social media spaces. So, yeah, we need we definitely need um, more and and maybe. Um, more collaboration on that topic, just so we're able to fully address this situation, and and not just and not exclusively from the regulatory aspect, because I, I need I, at least to me the solution needs to be something more than that, like some so some capacity building, as you were saying, like regulatory approach, and then some more collaboration between stakeholders. So I'll go, I'm gonna stop at that because I also see that Eric has his hand up on the on the room. So Eric, please take the floor. Um, hello, good afternoon, good morning. Um, apologies, I won't be able to open my camera also because I may lose the connection. But um, I would like also to um, comment, um, not comment, but rather tell on the experiences of the Philippines regarding gender disinformation because um, Philippines has a long history of disinformation starting from um, vaccine hesitancy, which dates back, as I guess, from the um, dengue vaccines that were invented during 2019. And now during the campaign season in the Philippines, um, I just want to highlight the role of the Philippine government and their supposedly troll farms, as we call it, in the worsening disinformation campaign here. So um, what's happening is that there is a campaign in order to make certain candidates look good despite their um, competence, incompetencies in the past. And what's worse is that um, the government is targeting um, certain women that are making rounds, in, that are making noise in order to combat this combat this information. Um, for example, our um, recipient for the Nobel Peace Prize, Maria Reza, um, she has been the target of the government for her um, bravery for speaking up against the Duterte, Duterte's administration war against drugs. And um, recently, um, the only female president presidential Lenny Robredo is also the target of the government because um, her track record is far more clean than the other presidentials, in my opinion. And now being a being the only one capable or competent of um, running the Philippines in the 2022 elections, um, she is now being discredited as um, as a uh, as a candidate because um, the government, uh, the Duterte's administration is now being threatened by her um, track record because the people are um, leaning towards Robredo's um, camp now. So um, I guess um, uh, this is um, also a, an experience in gender disinformation because I don't think that um, there are um, states that are in the center of this um, this information campaign, and by far, they are also targeting women that are seemingly um, threatening their or challenging their powers in order to be um, in order to appear as more um, confident or appear to be strong in the eyes of the people. That's all. Thank you so much. And we also have a second hand up on the room as well. Yes, so, Leah from the Bangladesh Hub. So um, you can unmute yourself, Anu, but, and the person who's speaking should identify himself or herself while speaking. We can see you all. Perhaps you can enable your audio now and try. Am I audible? Yes. Thank you so much for allowing Dhaka Bangladesh Remote Hub to ask the question. Uh, myself, uh, Faisal Ahmed Bhuvan, uh, I was the uh, Youth IGF Member Secretary 2021. Uh, the question is, uh, while serving human rights, most of the online black hats, molesters are getting privacy and teasing women on internet. How can we uh, serve gender equity and comfort having green flags on digital rights? Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your question. I don't know um, if Amrita, when do you want to start taking this question? 
because um yeah as as somebody who I, I as somebody who has been trying to work with this this topics for a while now um to serve gender inequity on the on the internet and 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 also like um being respectful of digital rights of women and also gender diverse groups it, it's also part of a to me, it's also part of a bigger and longer strategy around capacity building and around um, just teaching people how some languages are not okay and some languages should not be shared around. Like a woman should never be questioned um, on the basis of being a mom, on the basis of not being able to, I don't know, be a parliamentarian because she has like two or three kids or something like that. So I, I still think that that's part of like a, a greater and maybe bigger societal change that maybe we all need to go through and just like steer away from those um, misogynistic ideas and thoughts that we are all kind of like um, taught at some point in our lives. But um, to me, it's a bigger strategy and, and a very deep question, to be honest. <laughs> Yeah, I agree, Bruna, to this, um, as in, it's very difficult and a tricky question, but it goes back, uh, as Bruna's, it's less of a technology issue and more of a social issue, um, because there are many behavior you will not do offline, as in, when you see a woman politician, for example, you may not uh, abuse her on, offline, but uh, when it is online, people use it because they like to hide behind that anonymity. Um, so um, I think the capacity building, as Bruna said, is very important that there should be some etiquettes on what you can do online and what you can't do online, especially um, when I look at um, emerging nations such as, and, and it happens in matured countries also, but in emerging nations more, there are new users coming in. They have the tool of internet in their hands and they think they can do everything. Uh, like, for example, a child is taught to cross the streets at a particular point, uh, you know, taking care that they do not get into an accident. Same thing is these uh, people are not taught because there is a lack of capacity. Um, everything is available in the hand. They can tweet, they can post anything, uh, but they don't even think before doing it. So I think uh, that capacity building is very important. Um, and while I would say that it is important that it, a person is identifiable on the internet, but in many nations, uh, anonymity is also required. So I think there has to be a balance between um, the two, as in, um, you know, everyone being identifiable in the internet is also a very tricky thing. Um, while it is good that you can nab culprits, but we see the way um, you know some people are targeted so i think it's a tricky question but that's what we could say is there anything else any question else so, uh, just... thank, you so much. thank you so much for the uh, perfect answer okay i think vim had more to uh, um, say vim over to you no i probably completely agreed with everything uh, everything you, th you said uh, but capacity building has, has been um, mentioned now a couple of times. And one thing I would like to add in, in capacity building is also on the side of the receiver, um, because it has been part of, of dealing with uh, how what you can do online, what you can post online. Probably there's also some, not only gender disinformation, but in, in misinformation, disinformation in general, um, the whole group of people that, and I think Nima mentioned it in, in, in a certain way, it was online, so it is true. Uh, that that is something that people need to be uh, taught that sometimes that filter uh, needs to be there to, to just question and, and where does it come from? But I think this is a community-wide problem and, and uh, it, it's, Works with it is the same with certain newspapers. It is the same with uh, with online. So that goes way further than 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 just um, online. Uh, but I think that's something very valuable also to learn people that it's not because something is online. Unfortunately, it would be the it probably would be the ideal world when you just have to switch on your computer and you can say uh, I found it on my I mean on it on my computer so it's it's worth i mean i personally had an experience when i started working was working for somebody that i already knew working with the internet my boss didn't and the beginning i was working 
uh, I had to fight to be able to, to allow to look something up on the internet. And after a year working, um, I had to do the opposite. I had to fight because the thing was, well, you can just open your computer and everything is there already. I had to say, no, no, it's not because it's uh, on the internet that is fallible. So that's something I wanted to, uh, wanted to add. And just to add one last, just adding one last thing to this conversation as well. Nest, like anonymity is not the main problem here, to be honest. Like um, the fact that some people sh might like hide behind um, pseudonyms or any other kinds of tricks um, in order to um, share this information or gender disinformation or gender-based violence online. This is not the main problem. The main problem is the is this culture that needs to be changed because like it's also a very complicated line for us to say that it's only about um, just like criminals hiding behind the internet and doing those things because we also need to acknowledge on at the same moment that sometimes the use of pseudon pseudonyms and um, some other um, privacy oriented solutions such as encryption and everything else it's what um, ensures that a lot of us a lot of us women activists politicians we can express ourselves online so um, i just wanted to make this this just short like highlight because um, we we need to focus maybe on on the right things and not just make this a conversation against um, anonymity, against encryption, or all of those tools who, who are also like very relevant tools for our freedom of expression online. So yeah, I don't know if anyone has any other points or yeah, please go ahead. Thank you so much. Dhaka Bangladesh, you must be so grateful to be a part of this ICF 2021 Poland. And we get lots of information and uh, we get some very good experience from this session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, actually, there is one more way um, in uh, which countries like Pakistan have been working on and uh, uh, we've exercised this particular, uh, you know, thing, uh, such as a lot a couple of months back, Pakistan, uh, uh, not the government, but the courts of Pakistan, uh, actually the banned uh, one of the application named TikTok. Uh, if you're aware of that, that was banned in Pakistan for a couple of months because it was seriously being misused and abused to uh, insult, malign, and harass people. But then finally, uh, it, uh, you know, uh, um, the courts decided again, the higher courts decided that banning an application is not the right idea. And they came up uh, with the, uh, the idea that we need to have more regulations. But as my fellow uh, from Africa, she's absolutely right. I completely endorse her. It's just not about regulation. It's about the basic ethics and the code of conduct and filters that needs to be applied. She's absolutely right. And I endorse this uh, particular matter because even in my part of country, if anybody abuses me and uses because I have... a uh, almost uh, more than uh, 2 million uh, social media followers in my country uh, who follow me. But at the same time, if somebody abuses me, it's just not me who knows it. It's public. It, it, it gets public to millions of people and they all get to know that this particular member of the parliament is being abused. Many of them might... Uh, uh, attack the other person but many of them might think that maybe you know so and so person is right and the disinformation that somebody is creating about me uh, him anybody my my constituents my voters my public supporters might get affected and it's not only them in particular me myself uh, i was strongly affected not only me, but my family was traumatized. My husband was in a, uh, you know, great stress for almost one week. When I switched my political party and joined the other political party uh, a year before the election, it's very common for men in Pakistan to do that. But as a woman, when I decided to leave a political party and join another political party, I was trolled and abused and, you know, there was a campaign that took over on the social media, which, which was a big trauma for my family, which was a big stress for my family. And it's absolutely right that how does the social media provider compensate with that? 
So there needs to be very strong check and balance that needs to be strong filters. And in my particular opinion, and a piece of suggestion that I would love to give to these social media providers is that until and unless we do not punish or penalize those people who misuse this particular tool, we cannot um, uh, curb this issue. Uh, at least those people who are creating fake accounts, all those people who are misusing these tools, they need to be punished for a level that they might, they might not be allowed to create any account by their own name using that particular social media tool for a particular period, period of time so that they may understand that abusing and misusing a tool is a crime. Thank and you. also like there is still a lot to be done on the channels for reporting those kinds of languages as well. Like we all know how, how I mean, they have, speaking specifically of like social media companies, they, they have completely improved in the past years, like in terms of how fast they can address those things. But we still know that um, it can be very different, like from just like um, a citizen and sometimes comparing to, I don't know, to a social media influencer or anyone with a more like uh, with more space on media and anything like that. So we need to have the same level of attention for whoever is the victim of these kinds of languages and everything else. And just to go back on the on how public these attacks can be as well. I mean, what can I, I, I couldn't go through this session without mentioning Bolsonaro and his sons like they are the top one. Um, guys in the in Brazil who has been um who have been directing like attacks and 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 kind of related disinformation um disinformation related statements towards journalism and at journalists and everyone else so it can be very public as well and it can and can come also from very high up places and and it often can be also part of like a state sponsored kind of propaganda against like some groups and everything else so that's why I say that not like just hitting or aiming on anonymity or anything like that won't necessarily like solve the issue because it's it's a way more complicated one yeah so Bruna we have a question which says can you please describe work being done if any on the intersection of big tech business models and the role of algorithms and algorithmic amplification in addressing online gender-based violence. This is a question and Jamie had a comment uh, stating that uh, while there are recommendations, they are not targeted to government or policymakers and would like to suggest that, um, that government policymakers are quite often keen for reports that make it really clear what regulatory or non-regulatory approaches is recommended to address a problem. So um, before Bruna can get into the question perhaps you know what we as a group are looking at is um, not really uh, it's too early to make actually recommendations per se but what we were also we wanted to make recommendations but um, you know but we thought since it's a very new topic and it has various dimensions perhaps we can cite um, things uh, approaches which various um, you know entities have taken with and perhaps provide some more insights on it and bpf does make recommendations but we are not so prescriptive as in anyone from the team bruna or chennai or bim uh, please uh, you know you feel free to add uh, anything here and um, you know since uh, and irene just um, you know just to answer that while uh, we are not talking much um, on the gender-based violence here. And I don't think there's anyone from the platforms who could answer it much better in terms of how their content moderation or the government's platform, you know, patterns are working. But if anyone from the audience or anyone wants to take it up, you could take up, or, or Bruna, if you want to try, you could, or I guess we are not quite equipped to answer this, right? No, just I, I could just highlight like some of the works that I have been following in the past year, but it's it's more on the advocacy and, and kind of like highlighting um, how this is a very present issue. And as I mentioned before, there is one very good um, report from two organizations in Brazil, one called Asmina and the other is called Internet Lab, and they have been doing um, a fair amount of work on 
analyzing and going through political speech and 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 try to understand how to what extent this is a this is a compelling and and, and a huge strategy this this gender disinformation slash hate speech directed towards women so this is one of the works i can highlight and i think shanai has her hand up just on that shanai if you want to come in and then we're going to go to nima because she has her hand up on the room as well but please go ahead shanai Thanks, Bruno. Uh, hi, everyone. I've just been following the conversation very lively, uh, and it's really great to see the insights that have come up. So I'm going to attempt to answer the question that's uh, been raised by Irene, thinking about work that's been done at the intersection of big tech business models and the role of algorithms and algorithmic application in addressing online gender-based violence. So um, thinking about the business models and the role of algorithms and algorithmic amplification, I think a lot of work that has been done has been from the transparency and accountability aspect. So um, last year, I do know that the Web Foundation actually had what they called the tech, tech lab, where they were trying to actually create policies targeted at um, big tech uh, companies to think about like what are the best ways to actually address online gender-based violence from a perspective of say for example content moderation of the algorithms and algorithmic amplification um, so that was some of the work that has been done in terms of recommendations but a lot of the times the criticism actually comes back to the nuances of the points raised in terms of around context um, so especially language, how, uh, as Nima pointed out, when you use a one term in the European context, but use it in the African context, it's going to have a different experience. And some terms that are usually prioritized are from where these big tech companies are usually located, which is either in Europe or US. So then what you find down is like there's a trickle down of resolution and regulations that then ha would have an impact for people from the global majority, people who are based in the African continent or Southeast Asia or Latin America. And I think the, the work, in terms of thinking about work that has been done, it would just be generally looking um, at the work on online gender-based violence that has been done by organizations such as the Women's Rights uh, Program at the Association for Progressive Communication finding articles that have been done on the work that's on gender IT, where a lot of it is assessing um, that kind of work. Recently, IT for Change actually put out, um, there's been work around trying to understand data. Um, so not just necessarily just looking at like online gender-based violence, but also the way in which data is approached or the data model, business model that is currently existing, how exploitative um, it is. I think in the submission that I worked on last year in terms of thinking about online gender-based violence, especially within the COVID-19 pandemic and connected to disinformation, is just how um, the prioritization of regulation around content disinformation around the pandemic was around like health information and making sure that people don't have the disinformation. However, that meant that for something such as online gender-based violence that has been a topic that we have continuously asked for big tech companies to focus on unpacking, they haven't prioritized this. So there's bits and pieces of work, but I think there's opportunity to actually really unpack how can we influence a shift to addressing online gender-based violence from a business model perspective, so that it's not just us trying to hold these companies accountable and then then them trying to provide solutions that would still fit in existent uh, business models. So that's my response to that. Thanks, um, Bruna, and thanks, Irene, for the question. Thank you so, so we much. We have 12 Shemari. more minutes just to give you all a head up. Uh, yes, Amrita, we just have a hand up in the room, but please go ahead, Nema. Um, thank you. I, I want to echo what um, I think Chennai just mentioned. And I wanted to highlight, you know, oftentimes when we're talking about addressing or curbing um, online gender-based violence or making the online space safe, the issue of freedom of speech always comes up. That you know you don't want to do that, then you're going to block freedom of speech. But in my understanding, I think freedom of speech is both ways. And we tend to look on one side of the coin for those who want to be vocal and critical, which is okay. But there is the other side of the coin um, if I'm going to be abused, harassed, and pushed out of the online space, is that not hindering my own freedom of speech? So when we're talking about freedom of speech, it's, it's important to have that balance and make sure that a certain group isn't empowered to make the other group not you know, have their voice. 
Because if you push me out, you're shutting me up. You're shutting me up. So in another way, you're making it impossible for me to exercise my own free freedom of speech. You know, there's a difference between being critique, um, uh, you know, being critical in terms of the political space, um, development space, et cetera, and when it's now abusive on an on individual context. Um, the other thing is, I think it's very important. Um, I know you, I'm, I think Amrita mentioned that you're not giving recommendations and you don't wanna be prescriptive, but I think the fact that this is about best practice, you know, the, I, I, I would like my call to action to, to, to you is to come up with a simplified best practice, which is not prescriptive because at the end of the day, any group can decide on how they use it, but at least to give some guidance on, on this topic. Um, finally, maybe there's also an opportunity to bring together, you know, the tech companies with yourselves, with um, representatives from the groups that you have identified, can we have a session to discuss these issues with them and start that brainstorming um, agenda? And finally, um, one of our ways forward I always find is, you know, when 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 an when an item is being championed by one of the UN organizations, it changes the space um, and how people relate to it. So maybe we have an opportunity through this, maybe one of our takeaways can be to bring on board you and women. How can we make online gender-based violence be recognized and be part of the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence? We're still in the 16 days right now, but you know, online gender-based violence is not prominently coming out on, on those discussions. So that was my final um, contribution. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. I think, you know, being a, a timekeeper, I would suggest, Bruna, that we ask Chennai to step in and perhaps summarize, though we, you know, we can keep on discussing and there is a lot to discuss. Uh, but Chennai, would you like to summarize, uh, you know, based upon everyone, how we should go ahead and what should be the next steps? Thank you so much, Amrita. Um, First of all, I just want to say thank you to Bruna and Wim who actually are holding the space in the room and allowing for these conversations to happen. And Amrita, you're still a moderation in the online space because sometimes what I've realized with IGF is finding that balance of, of online participants and offline participants is pretty tricky. But as Wim had said earlier, I think they've done a great job this time around. To summarize the discussion, there were so many um, great points and insights, especially of, of value having um, parliamentarians, policymakers in the room who can give us guidance in, in terms of thinking about the process. Um, what is clear is that there is a need to potentially think about connecting, um, not think, but to actually work on connecting gender disinformation, not necessarily as a new phenomena, but a new phenomena in terms of the tools that are being currently used, but it's a generational issue that continues to exist. Secondly, um, a lot of the points that came out were also like, how do we engage um, different stakeholders, such as the social media companies or big tech giants themselves, as well as like cybersecurity entities that are in the regulatory and legal space, and really thinking about connecting them to actually have solutions that will have a balance of rights, so that at the end of the day, uh, we don't have an issue where some people are making regulatory decisions that are going to, to limit the rights of others in this in this space. And I think that's always a conversation when we think about ensuring um, gender digital rights. And then another uh, point that I thought really stood out also was really thinking about how, you know, the definitions that we have and connecting them to the existing issues already at play. So the strong point that was raised around uh, myths have been existent and those already work on human rights violations issues and then tying it back to those issues so that at the end of the day, we're talking about the lived realities of people and then adding them onto that um, gender disinformation perspective, not necessarily to then say it's just gender disinformation happening and it's not connected to existent issues. And there were so many, I think there were examples that were raised that or potentially we could also include in the report as there are different case studies that we have in the report. Um, it would be great for people to then, if you have these examples in terms of like links, there's some links that I copied from the Google chat, especially the examples raised around from the Philippines. Um, and I think 
um, some that were raised from Pakistan or from, um, from Tanzania, it would be also be great to have these added into the report so that we can document even as links and resources to some of the, um, the interventions. And I think lastly, as an action point, like we like I think there's been a strong um, concern that we put together a, a guidance or, or at least like a a baseline best practice and often I like to call them as best fit practices so I think setting it up in that perspective of actually having a best practice that we then can then say can be adapted to different regions and to different localities is something that we definitely um, would think of working on and I actually encourage everyone in the room who might from this conversation have best practices that they think are important to include to share them on the email address, uh, contact agenda at, interga at in intergalforum.org. Share these with us and we'll be able to add them into the document. And I also encourage everyone to join the mailing list for the Gender and Digital Rights uh, Best Practice Forum. And if you're interested in being part of the steering committee for 2022 or to continue this work, even if, you know, within the Internet Governance Forum, I think this is a space where we do want the, con like we always say around gender and the digital rights space of gender and access as initially was. We continuously push for it in the Internet Governance Forum because we want to have a space where people have these conversations and it's clear that it's an important topic and we want to also influence the space within um, IGF. So those are my key takeaways and I encourage people to write to us. Um, I'll ask them if we have a deadline for when we have to finalize the report, but thank you so much for participating in the session. And we really, really look forward to continued collaboration with all of you. Amrita, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you. Uh, we have four minutes. So Wim, uh, if you would like to say something and Bruna. Uh, just a quick re reaction on deadlines. Yeah, for this, uh, this year's report, uh, we really would like to invite quick reactions uh, because the idea is that it is finalized um, and included with the rest of the official outputs of this IGF before the end of the year. So I would say if in the course of next week, we can send reactions. Uh, and then it is up for the new Mac to uh, decide on uh, or select best practice forms for next year. Uh, so I think suggestions of uh, concrete suggestions of what uh, the gender BPF on this topic uh, could be, um, or, or, or what could be in, in, in that proposal to continue this work would be really welcome for, also for the uh, MAC coordinators to work with and come up with, uh, with a new proposal to continue this work into, into next year. Yes, and just to also take the opportunity of thanking everyone who has been involved with this BPF this year, all of the specialists we spoke with, like Ellen Judson, um, Courtney Raj, um, and also a lot of the people who joined our sessions too. This was all um, the beginning of a process. Um, if anyone that's attending this session um, has any ideas or suggestions as when we're saying for, as how should we um, continue to develop this topic for the upcoming year, they're all very much welcome in terms of suggestions and how to move the work forward. So thank you all for being here and I guess, um, yeah, we can call the session out. Minute, off, yeah. yeah, and we still have one minute, 30 seconds left. So we did it yeah. well in time. <laughs> thank you everyone. And also thank you for the technical team in the, yeah. in the room and for the people, uh, well, from that could not uh, follow us here and uh, for connecting to us. But sometimes I, I had a feeling at very early or very late hours, uh, but still thank you for, uh, for joining us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you and bye.